everybody. We um, welcome Dr. Harry Cliff uh, here. He is a particle physicist um, at the University of Cambridge, and he works on the Large Hadron Collider experiment, which I'm sure most of you heard of it, but if not, it's a huge particle detector buried 100 meters underground near CERN in Geneva. You might have seen it in some sort of films. I think it's been in Dan Brown films, that kind of thing. Um, so Dr. Harry Cliff did his bachelor's MSci and PhD at the University of Cambridge, um, where he's now a science museum fellow and a particle physicist. So I'll just pass, pass over to you. Oh, well, thanks, thanks for the introduction <laughs> for having me. It's nice to talk to you, albeit uh, virtually. Um, so I, I kind of I have to make an admission to start with, which is I submitted a title and abstract for this talk a bit in a bit of a rush, and then when I was trying to figure out what I was going to say today, I was like, "Oh God, the future of particle physics is a pretty big topic." So I'm <laughs> going to add some um, some qualifiers and say this isn't going to be this isn't the definitive uh, future of particle physics. Um, and actually, a lot of the talk will be about what's happened recently because to understand where we're going, we need to sort of know where we are. And I'm mostly going to focus on a particular area of particle physics, which is collider physics. This is the physics. Part, this is particle physics done at big machines like the LHC, where we smash things into each other and see what happens, as opposed to neutrino physics and, and you know, uh, other types of particle physics, which I, which I won't really touch on because it's not my area of expertise. That, but those uh, caveats aside, like, off we go. So um, I thought I'd start just by uh, setting the scene up. I'd take you back to the very start of my career. So this is a photo that I took at CERN, that, which is the home of the LHC uh, out near Geneva in the summer of 2007. So I was there in, as an undergraduate summer student. And at the time, it was a really exciting time to be at CERN because uh, the LHC, this gigantic machine, uh, which had been planned since the 1970s, had been under construction for several years by this point, was almost finished. And you can see here in this picture, these are giant sections of one of the detectors uh, lined up in a big surface building, ready to get taken underground and installed on the experiment. So you had a real sense of something sort of important and dramatic happening. And here's me with some inadvisable hair aged about 21 uh, down one of the experimental caverns standing next to the, uh, the Atlas detector, which is one of these giant experiments. You can't really see it properly in the shot, unfortunately, because there's various things blocking it. But this was a it was a really exciting time. Uh, to be out at CERN and there was a real sort of palpable excitement and the reason ultimately for that is that this machine was about to switch on so this is a, a an aerial shot of the uh, area uh, just outside Geneva in Switzerland you can see in the distance uh, the Alps and then Lake Geneva is that bluish bit in the in the sort of middle of the screen and then marked in yellow you've got the route of the Large Hadron Collider so the actual machine, of course, is not on the surface, it's 100 metres underground. And essentially what this is, is a giant ring, uh, 27 kilometres in circumference. And what it does is, or what it was going to do, is accelerate protons uh, to very, very high speeds, just a, a whisker below the speed of light, smash them into each other, and then we were going to see what, what happened. So 2007, this uh, the startup of the LHC was about a year away. So after decades of work, this thing was finally about to to switch on and hopefully teach us lots of new things about the the fundamental structure of matter the origins of the universe so um to understand why there was so much excitement uh, back in 2007-2008 i need to first of all give you a, a very brief introduction to particle physics now this is hopefully sort of relatively familiar because i know a lot of you are chemists but i'll, I'll take you through it briefly so i'm going to introduce something called the standard model which is our current best description of the elementary particles that make up the world and the, the forces that, that bind them together. So to start uh, with the basics, the first particle, oops, excuse me, sorry, something's happened there. The first particle that we discovered uh, way back in the 19th century was the electron, um, which I guess a lot of chemistry is associated with studying the way electrons behave and are inter exchanged between different atoms. Um, and then uh, in the nucleus of the atom, there are two other fundamental particles, the up quark and the down quark, which bind together to make protons and neutrons. So you have basically all of the ordinary matter in the universe made of just these three particles. But this is not the end of the story. There are a bunch of others you've probably heard of. Uh, there's something called a neutrino, which is a neutral, extremely light particle, uh, which uh, produced in, uh, in uh, radioactive decay, amongst other things. There are trillions of them going through every second, but they're produced by the sun and in various other processes out in the cosmos. Um, but we're completely unaware of them because they don't really interact with matter much. 
Um, so these four particles, the two quarks, the electron and its neutrino, make up what's called the first generation of matter. And for reasons we do not understand, uh, there are two additional generations. So um, there are we, we've discovered through collider experiments and cosmic ray experiments that there are heavier versions of the particles that I just introduced. So for example, um, the electron has a heavy version called the muon, which is about 200 times heavier than the electron but has exactly the same properties. The only difference is that muons, and in fact, all of these other particles in this table, apart from the guys in the first column, uh, are unstable, and they decay usually with quite short lifetimes, eventually down into the ordinary uh, first generation stuff. So there's a bunch of other particles. We don't really know why they exist. We just observe that they do. Um, and then there's also particles associated with the, the three forces that are described by the standard model. There's uh, the electromagnetic force, the force that binds electrons to atomic nuclei and responsible for light and various other phenomena, a familiar particle probably uh, there is the photon. And then there are particles called gluons, which are associated with the strong force, which is the force that binds quarks together inside protons and neutrons. And then finally, there are these two rather strange particles, the Z and the W boson, which are the force particles of something called the weak nuclear force, which is a force responsible for radioactive decay and also for how uh, different uh, particles transform from one type into another. So, so that, was, that was a bit of a rattle-stop tour, but those were the particles that were known before the LHC switched on. And one of the reasons that the LHC was built was to finally complete this picture. It was known that there must be something missing here because uh, in order to explain uh, how many of these particles acquire mass, uh, theorists back in the 1970s and 80s had proposed the existence of a further fundamental particle known as the Higgs boson. It's this final piece of the puzzle. And I'll, I'll now briefly uh, explain what a Higgs boson is and why we were trying to, trying to find one at the LHC. So one thing, first of all, you need to understand is that particle physics as a subject is, is rather badly named. Actually, particles are not what we believe to be the most fundamental building blocks of the universe. In fact, what we really think the universe is made from fundamentally are quantum fields. So these are, field, uh, the idea of a field is hopefully familiar to most of you. If you've ever held a, a magnet next to a piece of iron and felt a force extended across a distance between the two, you're feeling the effect of a magnetic field, for example. And there are in fact, uh, a whole bunch of fields in nature beyond just the magnetic field. There's obviously electric fields, there's gravitational fields. But in our modern description of particle physics, every one of these particles I just described to you is thought of as being a small ripple, a disturbance in an associated field. So this image is a cartoon by a colleague of mine, David Tong, who's a theoretical physicist. And this is essentially a sort of little diagram of what particle physics is really like. So the idea is these particles are these kind of blobs, these disturbances in these underlying fields which are always there. So for example, if we take the electron, the electron is not actually, in a sense, a fundamental object. It is a disturbance in a field called the electron field, which is everywhere in space. And the same is true for the quarks, their disturbances in quark fields. The photon is a disturbance in the, in the electromagnetic field and, and on it goes. So that's the, that's the first thing to understand. But so, so what's it got to do with the Higgs boson? Well. The, the basic idea of, of the Higgs mechanism is that the reason that the electron, the quarks have mass is that they interact with an additional quantum field, another field that hadn't yet been observed, known as the Higgs field. And essentially, the idea is that the Higgs field is all around us. It's an invisible quantum field. It fills the whole universe. And particles like electrons, as they move through this field, the field kind of uh, group, uh, kind of clusters around them and imbues uh, some energy into the electron, giving it the property of mass. So that's the basic idea behind uh, the Higgs. And the, the problem is, okay, we've invented a new invisible quantum field, which is responsible for giving mass to the particles, but how do you know it's there? Well, a bit like the air in this, in, in a room, you know, you can't really see, you can't see the air, but one of the ways you know that you're in room full of air, apart from the fact you're not suffocating, is that you can hear sounds moving through the air. So those are vibrations in the air. So if you can create a vibration in the Higgs field, that would also be detectable. And that shows up as a new particle called the Higgs boson. So that ultimately 
is what the Higgs boson is. It's a it's a quantized ripple. I'm sorry, in this underlying Higgs field. So that so finding the Higgs boson was one of the big targets of the LHC because it would actually finally confirm the last missing piece of this standard model that I described to you, and then you would have, in principle at least, a complete description of the fundamental laws that govern the ordinary matter that makes up our universe. And I, I qualify that by saying the ordinary matter that makes up our universe, because we also know that there is a lot the standard model cannot explain. So the Higgs was one target the LHC, but there were many others. And one of the big ones is something called dark matter, <clears throat> which you've probably heard of. Now, dark matter, the evidence for the existence of dark matter comes from astronomy. And without going into too much detail, in essence, from various different types of astronomical measurements, there's now really overwhelming evidence that there is a huge amount of material out there in space, which uh, provides uh, gravity, affects the orbits of stars around galaxies and the movement of light through the universe and the expansion of the universe. This matter is completely invisible to our telescopes. And as far as we can tell, it's not made of any of the particles that we know of in the standard model. Um, so it's believed that this is a little pie chart that shows you what cosmologists and astrophysicists tell us the universe is made of. So this is a sort of cosmic pie chart. Five percent of it is made of atoms. So that is us. That's the Earth. That's stars, dust, gas, anything we can see with telescopes in the night sky. And this is the little this little five percent sliver is what the standard model of particle physics describes. Then the other 95 percent is made of dark matter and something even more mysterious called dark energy. And we have no idea what these things are. And then we know for, with, for, with a high degree of certainty that they do exist, but that they cannot be explained by any of the particles in the standard model. So this gives us a very good reason for thinking that there must be some new uh, fundamental ingredients of the universe to be discovered. And hopefully the LHC uh, would provide uh, clues to some of these, perhaps allowing us to create a dark matter particle in one of the collisions. Another big problem uh, that the LHC was targeting was to do with um, matter's mirror image, which is known as antimatter. So uh, for every matter particle in the standard model, for example, the electron, there is a corresponding antiparticle, which is identical in every way, but has the opposite electric charge. So for example, the electron, as you will know, is negatively charged. The anti-electron or the positron is positively charged. In the same way, uh, the up quark, which has a, a plus two thirds charge, has an anti version called the anti up quark, uh, which has a charge of minus two thirds. Now, in the standard model, there is a very, very precise symmetry between matter and antimatter. In other words, antimatter is almost in almost an exact reflection of matter. But this leads to a bit of a problem because if we go back to the very early universe and consider uh, how matter formed in the first uh, millionth of a second after the Big Bang, because of this symmetry between matter and antimatter, we would expect equal quantities of matter and antimatter to have been created in the Big Bang. Now that would have been very, very bad for us indeed, because what would have happened is as the universe expand and cooled down, eventually all the matter and antimatter would have met up and annihilated each other. And we would have been left with a universe with nothing in it, apart from some photons wandering through this in infinite blackness. So, uh, this is one of the another big outstanding problem in fundamental physics. How is it that there is matter in the universe when it should all well have been annihilated uh, at the beginning of time? And again, one of the hopes was that the LHC would give us some clues, perhaps uh, allowing us to create some new particles or detect evidence of asymmetries between particles and antiparticles that might help solve this mystery. And finally, I'm going to bring you to, I'm going to mention one other uh, big outstanding problem. So um, this is sort of, uh, in a way, a slightly more difficult to understand problem, but it's actually one that's driven uh, a lot of theoretical and experimental work over the last 20, 30 years or so. And it's to do with the Higgs uh, boson itself. So even before we knew that the Higgs existed, we knew that there was actually a bit of a problem with this idea of the Higgs. And it's to do with this Higgs field that I described to you. So the Higgs field, as I said, is um, everywhere in space, and the Higgs field is what's responsible for giving mass to the other particles in the standard model. Now, the Higgs field has a unique property. It's different from every other field that we know about in that it has a constant value everywhere in space. Now, to understand why that's, why that's a bit odd, if you think about, say, a magnetic field, now, if you take, take a magnet, and if you were to measure the magnetic field around that magnet, you would find that close to the poles of the magnet, 
the magnetic field would be strong, would be have a high value. But if you move away from the magnet, the field gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And if you went to an infinite distance, eventually the strength of that magnetic field would go to zero. Now, the Higgs field is different in the sense that it doesn't matter where you are in space, it always has a constant value. It's a bit like you've sort of raised the temperature of the whole universe to a certain level. And it's that constant amount of energy stored in the Higgs field that is ultimately responsible for other particles acquiring mass. So it's through interacting with this energy stored in the Higgs field that they get their mass. Now, this is where we come to the, the, the problem. So if you do some naive calculations using what we understand about particle physics, you discover something rather surprising and troubling, which is that there are actually only two likely values that the Higgs field should take. One of them is that it has an absolutely enormous value, something known as the Planck energy. So this is a gigantic number, uh, uh, 10 billion billion um, giga electron volts. A giga electron volt is a particle physics unit. It's roughly equal to the mass of a proton. So this is a giant amount of energy. If the Higgs field had a value this large, every particle in the universe would become so heavy that it would collapse in on, in on itself into a black hole and you would end up with a universe full of black holes and nothing else. So this is clearly not the situation we find ourselves in. The other uh, likely result is that the Higgs field ends up with a value of zero. Now this is also problematic because if the Higgs field is off effectively, if it has a zero value, that means none of the particles in nature have mass and that means atoms can't form and therefore we don't exist and the universe would just be full of a sort of fuzz of, of light particles zipping around uh, close to the speed of light. So these are the, as I said, the calculations suggest that we should really live in a universe that's either in category A or category B, but actually our universe, the Higgs field has a value, a specific value of 246 giga electron volts, which is neither 10 billion billion nor zero. Um, and it turns out that this, uh, in order to achieve this value, you have to do something very peculiar, which is you have to fiddle around with all the fundamental constants of nature and basically tune them to very specific values in order to get the Higgs field to sit at this nice Goldilocks value of 246. And if you change any of those constants, even a little bit, you, in, you very quickly will get driven into one of the other two scenarios, either where everything's a black hole or where there are no atoms. So this is this looks deeply fishy and suspicious if you're, you know, if you're a scientist, because it sort of suggests that somehow the universe has been fiddled about with in order to create conditions that are conducive to the formation of atoms and therefore wobbly flesh colored things made of atoms like us. This is um, technically known in particle physics as the hierarchy problem. Uh, and it's, again, uh, uh, something that really caused a lot of consternation and drove a lot of theoretical development. So a bunch of different ideas were proposed to try to solve this problem. Um, they come with names like supersymmetry, extra dimensions. These are sort of hidden dimensions of space that, you know, beyond the, the ones we're familiar with the existence of micro black holes. But basic, the basic idea is that to solve this problem and indeed to solve the dark matter problem and the antimatter problem, we expected to see new phenomena at the LHC. That could be new particles, that could be black holes, that could be extra dimensions of space. So, um, so the, the point I ultimately wanted to make is to say that back in 2007, before the LHC switched on, we had really great hopes that the LHC would find some answers to some of these questions, but also uh, the first target, of course, was to find the Higgs itself, which still hadn't been discovered uh, before the LHC switched on. So um, I will now uh, quickly uh, take you on a little tour of the LHC and explain how it works. So as I said, it's this giant 27 kilometer ring and somewhere uh, over here at Mark CERN, there is a little bottle of hydrogen gas. That hydrogen gas is ionized with an electric field. The protons are removed and they are sent off through a series of accelerators and then sent into the LHC. So they go around the ring. You have two beams, one going clockwise and one going anti-clockwise. And uh, as they go around the ring, each time they pass a little section of the ring, which is, I don't know if you can see my cursor but about here, they get a whack from a two million volt electric field that accelerates them to higher and higher speeds until eventually they are going at 99.999999% of the speed of light. 
And once they are going at this incredible speed, they're smashed into each other. These two beams are brought into collision inside four giant detectors. So you can see those marked Atlas, Alice, CMS, and LHCB. So these are four big, effectively digital cameras that record the collisions as they happen and scour them for signs of new particles. So um, if you went down into the tunnel of the LHC, this is what you would see, a very, very, very long tunnel about you know, a few meters across containing this very long blue tube. This blue tube is the LHC itself, most of which is made of superconducting magnets whose job it is to bend uh, the protons as they go around the ring. Because the protons are going incredibly quickly, even to go around at such a jet, you know, this giant 27 kilometer curve, you need incredibly powerful magnets to keep them on their orbit. And that's, what's, um, that's what these blue things are. And then at four points around the ring, the tunnel opens up into these much larger subterranean spaces. This is a photograph of one of those uh, spaces housing the CMS uh, experiment. So uh, this is a giant particle detector. It's 15 meters high, uh, 20 meters long, and it weighs about 14,000 tons. Uh, you, to give you a sense of scale, this is a, a little chap in a hard hat standing at the bottom of the detector. So the particles collide right in the middle of this thing, and it's made a, it's sort of a bit like an onion made up of concentric layers of detector material. And as the particles go out through the detector, this allows the physicist to create a sort of three-dimensional uh, record of what's happened in the collision. Um, so this is what one of those collisions uh, looks like. This is actually a real collision taken, I think, in the early morning on the 11th, on the 25th of June back in 2011. And what you can see here are uh, essentially new particles being created from energy. So what the LHC ultimately does, what it really is, is a, a matter making factory. So it, the reason we accelerate these protons to very high speeds is we want to give them huge amounts of kinetic energy. And then when they collide, that kinetic energy is converted into mass energy in the form of new particles. So what you're seeing here are not, well, some of it is inside bits from the inside the protons. So you're seeing quarks and gluons and things get knocked out. But a lot of what you're seeing here are brand new particles that have been created out of energy. And the reason you want a, a very high energy in your collision is so that you can make really heavy new particles because the, the higher the energy, the heavier the particle you can create and the more likely you are to discover something new. The reason that the, the Higgs boson had never been seen before is that no previous collider had been big enough or, or powerful enough to create the Higgs because it was too heavy. It was out of their, out of their energy reach, essentially. So um, that's how the LHC works. And, and we had, uh, so it, it didn't actually take very long for the first big triumph to, to take place. So in 2012, on the 4th of July, uh, which sort of became known in CERN folklore as Higgs Dependence Day, uh, there was a big meeting called at CERN to announce the discovery of the Higgs boson. And this is a, a photograph of the lecture theater at CERN. You can see everyone celebrating and clapping. It's a really, really exciting day. Uh, Peter Higgs and Francois Anglais, who were the two theorists uh, who were still, still alive, who proposed uh, the existence of the Higgs boson back in 1964 were there. They were in the room. It was really quite emotional, I think, for them, because I don't think either of them expected something they predicted almost half a century earlier to finally be discovered. So that that was a, a great day. And th this is just to show you what everyone's cheering. Uh, they were cheering these two uh, these two graphs. Particle physicists love to see bumps in graphs. And these, these are uh, graphs produced by the two big experiments at the LHC, the ATLAS experiment and the CMS experiment. And you can see, if you wanted to know what Higgs boson looks like, this is ultimately what it looks like, a little blip uh, in a graph. And that was the, the, the smoking gun to tell us that this Higgs particle had been detected, being created uh, in, inside these two giant experiments. So that was a really exciting time back in 2012. And, you know, sort of on our checklist of things we wanted to, found, found to find, we ticked off the Higgs boson, we completed the standard model, and, and then the next big goal was to go out and try to find answers to some of these other big questions that I discussed, dark matter, antimatter, the hierarchy problem. Unfortunately, um, the story of the years since then, which has now been almost 10 years since the, the Higgs was discovered, it'll be 10 years next year, is that the LHC has 
basically provided us with no clues as to what might come after the Higgs. So here's a series of newspaper articles um, reporting on results from the LHC going back actually 2011, when a result from the experiment that I work on LHCB had um, sort of uh, ruled out certain versions of that theory called supersymmetry that I mentioned. And the story since then has really been very similar. Uh, this is another story about supersymmetry uh, being bruised by um, you know, more negative results. Um, other ones about new physics theory disappear, running out of hiding places as more results come in from the LHC. Um, you know, and there were even a few false dawns when there was signs that maybe uh, we'd seen signs of a new particle and then it disappeared once we analysed our data in a bit more detail. So, uh, of course, lots of lots of very important physics has gone on at the LHC. I don't want to uh, give you the impression that nothing has been discovered since the Higgs. There's been lots of uh, measurements made of the particles we already know about, uh, better understanding the standard model, uh, discovering various exotic things made of quarks and so on. But in terms of those big questions that I gave you at the beginning of the talk, there has been really no signs of, of what might come next and no signs of any new particles that could help to solve, uh, to answer some of these questions. So th this has led to, I think it's fair to say, something of a, of a crisis in, in particle physics, or certainly a crisis in theoretical particle physics, physics, because a lot of the most promising theoretical ideas that uh, people had really been hoping to see evidence for once the LHC switched on have turned out not to be correct and, and ultimately a lot of them have now been ruled out and it's really caused a lot of people to have to go back to the drawing board and start to think well we know we have these big unsolved questions uh, in, uh, to do with fundamental physics coming from astrophysics and cosmology in particular and yet this giant experiment that we've built has so far given us no clues as to where we should be going next. Now I said it's given us no clues. There is a little addendum to that, which actually comes from the experiment that I work on. So this is a photograph of one of the other four uh, detectors at the LHC. This is LHCB, which is the machine, the detector experiment that I work on. It's an international uh, experiment like they all are. That was about 1400 of us working on this project. Now, what LHCB, in essence, is very similar to the other three, the other three experiments in that it's a big detector made of layers and its job is to record collisions. But what we are actually interested in is slightly different from um, some of the other experiments, the LHC. And I'm first of all going to explain to you uh, the difference in the types of physics that the, the, the LHCB does versus um, ATLAS and CMS, the other two big LHC experiments. So Broadly speaking, uh, there are two different ways that you can go looking for new particles at a collider. One of these is known as a, a direct search. So essentially what happens here is you have uh, your two particles, your two protons, you accelerate them to very high energies, energy E, you smash them into each other and you hope that you create some new particles. And the maximum mass of new particle that you can create is limited by how much energy you can give your two protons. So hopefully you're familiar with the equation E equals mc squared, Einstein's famous equation that essentially expresses the fact that mass is just another form of energy. Well, you can use that equation to figure out what's the maximum mass of a particle you can create if your protons both have energy E and it comes out at 2E divided by the speed of light squared. So the advantage of a direct search is you, you, know, you, you can create the new particles in your experiments. And if you see them, that's really clear evidence there's something new there. And that's indeed how the Higgs was discovered. One of the disadvantages of this approach is that if, you're, if the particle you're looking for has a mass that's higher than the energy of your collider, then you will not be able to create it and you will not get any evidence of it. So this is where LHCB comes in and, and a slightly different approach that we take. So what we do instead is what are called indirect uh, searches. So rather than looking for new particles directly, instead what we do is look for the influence of new heavy particles on the particles that we already know about, on the, on the standard model particles. So um, and a, a silly analogy may help at this point. I mean, to, to give, you, give you an idea, imagine, for example, that you are uh, looking for an elephant in a jungle. Now, the direct approach to finding the elephant would be to go out, wander through the jungle and try to stumble upon the elephant in a clearing somewhere, perhaps. 
But if the jungle is really big and there's, you know, there's only one elephant in it and you don't really know where to look, then you might spend ages wandering about the jungle and never find it. So that's sort of the direct approach. Another approach you might take would be to say, OK, well, rather than just wandering around the jungle, what I'm going to do is go in sort of to the easy, access, easy to access bits of the jungle and look for signs of footprints left on the forest floor. So you might not have much chance of seeing the elephant directly, but you might have a better chance of seeing some footprints it's left behind. And then you would know uh, that there's an elephant in the jungle. You may not know exactly what type of elephant it is, but you know, you know there's something out there and then the sort of, you can use then the more direct route to go off and try and actually find the elephant itself. So this, this indirect approach, looking for footprints is sort of what we do at LHCB. And basically what we're doing is we're looking at the, the effect that, uh, undiscovered new particles could have on the ordinary particles that we know about. So to give you an example, um, let's imagine you have some particle that you, a standard model particle, in this case it's something called a bottom quark, but it doesn't really matter too much what a bottom quark is, it's a sort of heavy version of the ordinary quarks that make up atomic nuclei. And we make lots and lots of these bottom quarks at the LH, uh, LHCb. So imagine you have a bottom quark, and that bottom quark is unstable, it decays into a bunch of other particles. Now this decay in the standard model will take place uh, through the, the forces that we know about in the standard model, usually the weak force. And because we have a very good understanding of the weak force, we can calculate from theory exactly how often a bottom quark should decay into a bunch of other particles. Um, but, but if there exist other particles beyond the standard model, these uh, additional particles can actually subtly affect this decay. So effectively, these other particles act as an additional route from the initial state into the final state. So you now have this new way that the particle de can decay. So you don't actually see the new particles directly, but they kind of mediate the decay. They're in there in the middle, invisible, undetectable, but they will subtly shift how often, for example, a beauty quark, a bottom quark rather, decays into a particular set of particles. So the game we play is to, you first of all make a very precise theoretical prediction of how often this decay should happen, and then you make a very precise measurement of how often the decay happens in reality. And if you see a difference between your prediction and your experimental result, that is indirect evidence that there are some new particles, new force fields uh, affecting the decay, and that is, is equivalent, I suppose, to seeing footprints uh, left by the elephant in the jungle. Now, so th that's broadly how we do physics at LHCB. We produce lots and lots of bottom quarks and we study their properties in a lot of detail. We make precise measurements and then we compare those precise measurements to theoretical predictions and see if we see a discrepancy. And indeed, in the last few years, we have started to see uh, a bunch of what are known as anomalies in the data. So these are basically bottom quarks not behaving as they are supposed to behave. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain exactly what we've seen. So here you have your bottom quark labeled B, and there is a particular way this bottom quark can decay uh, via the weak force into a strange quark, which is the thing labeled S, and two electrons. So that is a, a well uh, established decay, and this only involves, as I said, uh, ordinary particles that we already know about. Now, alongside this decay, there is a second decay, which is very similar, except you swap uh, the electrons in the final state for their heavier versions called muons. Now, in the standard model, I think, I, as I said at the very beginning of the, the talk, muons are sort of these heavy version of the electrons, and they have exactly the same properties as electrons, except they have a, a bigger mass. Now that means that a bottom quark should decay into electrons equally as often as it decays into muons. So if you have these two decays, one involving electrons, one involving muons, and you measure how often they happen, you would expect them to happen exactly as often as each other. This is something known as lepton universality. Lepton is just a fancy word for an electron or a muon. Um, it doesn't really matter particularly. But the basic idea is you, um, you measure how often these two decays happen, you compare them, and <clears throat> they ought to come out as happening equally as often. Now, there have been a bunch of results from LHCB over the last few years, 
so in the standard model, as I said, if you take a ratio of the number of muon decays to the number of electron decays, you expect that number to be one. But in 2014, a measurement was made of this process. And rather than coming out as being one, i.e. equal numbers of muons and electrons, it actually came out at 0.75 plus or minus 0.1. So this is not one by about two and a half standard deviations. So it's two and a half errors away from being equal to one, which could be uh, a clue that something interesting is going on. Now, this is not enough evidence on its own to conclude that we've seen something new that the standard model cannot explain, but it's certainly intriguing. Then in 2017, a further measurement was made of a, of a very similar process in a slightly different set of particles, but basically the same idea. And again, the, the number came out at 0.68 plus or minus 0.08 instead of one. So again, it's uh, this time more than, um, actually this time it's about three uh, errors, three standard deviations away from one. So when the 2017 result came out, people started to get quite excited because you had two different measurements with independent data, both suggesting that, uh, the, that the, the observations we were seeing were not consistent with the standard model. And to be clear, every experiment we've ever done uh, has agreed with the standard model beautifully. And we have seen no evidence, at least in particle physics, of anything deviating from the standard model. So this, this would really be a, a really big deal. If, we, if, this, if this was borne out, it would suggest that we are finally getting some evidence of something beyond the standard model. It could be dark matter. It could be something weird that we've not even imagined yet, but it's, it's certainly exciting. Um, so these results were updated in 2019 uh, with more data. And again, the number came out not quite equal to one. Unfortunately, the, as you can see, the value moved from about 0.7 to about 0.85. So it got a bit closer to one, but the error got smaller. So we're in a slightly frustrating position still of not uh, knowing whether this is a statistical fluctuation, whether it's um, you know, some systematic effect that we've not taken into account, or whether this really is uh, evidence of some new physics. So Actually, at the moment at LHCB, there's lots of work going on to repeat these measurements with much larger amounts of data. So I hopefully in the next, well, I shouldn't really reveal exactly when, but certainly in the next few months, we'll get an update on this result. And, and we, if we're lucky, we may finally get uh, conclusive evidence that there is really something new, or we may find that this effect disappears. And hopefully it, it doesn't, but you know, we have to just wait and see. Um, it, uh, looking into the future, LHCB is going to be taking a lot more data. In fact, the whole experiment um, is currently being upgraded. So here you can see some people working down in the experimental cavern underground to essentially replace most of the detector. And that's to allow us to record data at a much higher rate. So in the next few years, LHCB is going to record, uh, I think, an order of magnitude uh, more data than it has so far. And that will really allow us to hone in on these processes really with really really high precision and hopefully see signs of places where the standard model is starting to crack and hopefully give us some evidence of what might come next so that's the the sort of near term for lhcb we really hope that some of these anomalies may turn out to be real looking a bit further into the future um, in uh, another thing that's going to be going on over the sort of middle part of the 2020s is a major upgrade to the Large Hadron Collider itself. So this is to the LHC itself, a bit the ring, and this uh, this is a this upgrade is essentially to allow the LHC to collide uh, more protons per second. <clears throat> so you have this problem in experiments, which, which is the longer you take data, every year of data you take you get a kind of law of diminishing returns because the, the fraction of new data is a, is, a, is a smaller and smaller fraction of the total that you've already recorded. So what you ultimately want to do, rather than just carrying on recording data at the same rate, is you want to increase the rate that you record data. So this big upgrade will install new magnets at, at the LHC, whose job it is basically to squash uh, the beams of protons to really, really small diameters. And that means when they cross each other, inside the detectors you get more collisions uh, per second more collisions per second means more data and that means you can discover rarer processes so there's still uh, i think some hope certainly that um 
in the next decade or so, this upgraded LHC will run into the middle of the 2030s, that we may still yet see some signs of dark matter or of some of these other new speculative ideas that were proposed. It may just be that they're much rarer or more difficult to create than we anticipated and that with a larger amount of data, we'll have a better chance of seeing them. So, so there is a sort of roadmap really going forward, uh, lasting for really another 15 years at the LHC. But actually, we're already starting to think the whole of the field of particle physics is starting to think about what might come after the LHC, because by 2035, this giant machine will really have run its course and there will be much more uh, that we can get out. Of. So what we then need to do really in order to move to the next level and start to be able to probe higher energies or to study rarer processes is to build a new collider. And that's what's currently being discussed. So um, this is, a, 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 again, an aerial shot of the area outside Geneva. And this is a proposed uh, scheme for an even larger particle collider, which is now for, for now known as the Future Circular Collider. So this is a machine that would dwarf the LHC. The LHC is 27 kilometer circumference. You can see that in the top of the, the image. The FCC would be 100 kilometers long. So it would actually be so big that it's, that it's really the biggest tunnel that you can fit in the Geneva Basin before you start hitting the Alps and the Jura Mountains uh, on the, on the left-hand side of the image. Um, and the reason you want to go bigger is because the bigger the machine, the higher the energies you can reach, and therefore you have a better chance of discovering new particles if they are out of reach of the LHC. And the reason that this is already being discussed is because um, projects like this take many, many decades to plan and then ultimately to build. So uh, the LHC was first discussed, to give you a sense, in the late 1970s, and it didn't begin colliding until 2009. The FCC, the most optimistic schedule is that you wouldn't see any uh, data from this machine until the 2040s, and it would probably run for around uh, 40 years until the, until the um, sort of late uh, 2070. So it's a really long term project, but you have to start thinking about these things way in advance if they've got any chance of getting off the ground. Um, obviously, machines like this uh, come with a pretty high price tag. Here's some sort of flashy imagery that's been made to, um, to give you a sense of what these things might look like. I think this is mostly to show to, to funding agencies, uh, but it gives you a sense. It, it's very similar to the LHC in terms of the principle, but just much, much bigger. Um, so the the sort of proposal for the FCC actually is in two parts. It's really two different accelerators. The first one, uh, which is represented by this blue circle, would be an electron-positron collider. So the LHC is what's called a hadron collider, which means it collides protons with each other. Now, the problem with protons is that protons are not fundamental particles. They're made of quarks and gluons. So when you smash them into each other, you get a load of crap going everywhere, and it's very hard to make precise measurements with these machines, although we have been managing to do that nonetheless. But the first phase of this new collider would be an electron-positron machine. And because electrons and positrons are fundamental particles, when they collide, they annihilate each other completely. They disappear. And all you get are the products of that collision. So in principle, that could be dark matter or it could be Higgs bosons. And the purpose of this first phase of the machine, the FCC electron-electron collider, would be to act as what's called a Higgs factory. So this would be to produce millions and millions and millions of Higgs bosons and measure the properties of the Higgs in really, really uh, high levels of detail. Uh, because as I said, one of the, a lot of the problems that we're facing in particle physics are to do with the Higgs and not really understanding how this weird particle can exist in the form it does. And in the, in the much longer term, after this electron-positron machine would come uh, a, a sort of supersized version of the LHC, a proton collider. And the advantage of a proton collider is that you can get protons to much higher energies than you can electrons. So you could get uh, these particles to almost 10 times the energy that you can at the LHC. And that would give us a really good chance of discovering some new particles, uh, be it dark matter or something we haven't uh, predicted at all. So um, I was going to give you some sort of a bit more detail on the physics of these things, but I know that I'm running out of time. So rather than, than blather on, um, I think I'll just sort of finish up there. But um, I'm obviously very happy to answer any questions you've got about what the, these next colliders 
uh, might help to tell us about the universe or whether we can justify the expense, which is a, and also a very, a very reasonable question. But um, I hope that's been been interesting and it was a pleasure to talk to you. And as I said, very happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you. That was such an interesting talk um, and a very honest talk as well about kind of the limitations and what what you'd hoped for. And um, I really enjoyed the um, kind of historical slant as well. The pictures of everyone being super excited when it was discovered. That was really nice. Um, so we will have some questions. So as, as usual, if you want to um, type in the chat, um, or if you want to raise your hand and I'll unmute you so you can ask a question. So I'm not sure, can you see the... I can um, see, I just brought up oh, the chat. So you can yeah. see the chat, okay. So it's um, just compliments at the moment, no, <laughs> no questions. Um, I can't see if anyone's, um, if anyone's got their hand raised. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question? I've got a question if that's okay. <laughs> um, it's when you're talking about the investigation into the probability between um, electrons and muons, mm. are you also further looking into that with taons or does that not occur? That's a very good question. So um, yes, it does occur. Um, the problem, so, so just for people who don't know very much particle physics, taus are the even heavier version of the electrons. There's three of these things, the electron, the muon and the tau. Um, now in principle, so the the reason that muons and electrons might not be behaving the same in these decays is because presumably because of some exotic new particle we haven't discovered that pre prefers to interact with muons or electrons for example now the third generation particle the tau on you would expect these effects to be even bigger because the tau is like really kind of exotic and is more likely to be strongly interacting with whatever the new yeah. particle is the problem with taus is that they're much it, it's they, they will definitely be being created in the in our experiments they're much more difficult to detect and the reason is that um because towers are very heavy they're also very short-lived so they only live for a, about i think i forget the exact number but it's of order a trillionth of a second um and that means they decay before they hit the detector whereas muons and electrons they actually get right through the detector so you can if you um, electron a muon they'll leave a track you can see where it's gone a tau decays in before it hits the detector and it decays into a bunch of things that all fly off in different directions, including neutrinos and neutrinos can't be detected. They, they don't yeah. interact with ordinary matter. So they just leave our detector completely. So we can do stuff with towels. It's just much more difficult because you're always missing some neutrinos. You've got to figure out which bits of the particles in your detector came from a towel. So there are people working on it for sure, but um, because of that, challenge the sensitivity of those measurements is much lower so um we'll probably we, we should start to get uh, results with towels as we move forward and we get more data but actually there's also another experiment in japan called bell 2 yeah. which um because of the way it's designed we're much better at seeing towels and so they may be able to do some of the measurements that we can't okay find. so it's a very long-winded answer to your question but i hope that's that that was great thank you very much um, I've got a question for, from, sorry, the name's not in the chat, but it's a, the email address is a Garnica, they're a, a guest. I think I've asked to unmute them, but if you just want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Maybe it was a legacy. Okay, hand. okay, okay, I managed to, to unmute. Oh. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so what what kind of process do you expect? Uh, do you, you see this discrepancy between in, in uh, between electrons and muons being produced from bottom decays, and what mm -hmm. kind of process is uh, is suspected to be the uh, to be responsible for this uh, for this discrepancy? Yeah. Is there any hint about what's going on? Yeah, so we don't have any direct evidence of uh, you know what's causing this at the moment but theorists have done very clever analyses where they look at that the, the, there are these these anomalies I mentioned there are also a bunch of other anomalies which are sort of related or in the same kind of area so what theorists can do is they can try out toy models 
and see what the effects are in these different bits of particle physics. And then basically you end up with two different, two possible answers, which is either it's something called a Z prime. So a Z prime is just a word for a, another particle associated with a force a bit like the weak force. So it would be like a sort of a super weak force, uh, a fifth force of nature that we haven't discovered so far. And this, one of the properties of this force would be that it interacts differently with electrons and muons and taus, for example. So that's one possibility. Um, the other is something called a leptoquark, uh, which is a, a, a particle which has the properties of both uh, leptons, which are things like electrons, well, electrons, muons, and taus are leptons, and also the properties of quarks. So um, there is no particle in the standard model, for example, that can decay into an electron and a quark, uh, you know, so producing an electron and a quark. But these leptoquarks could do this. Um, so it could be something called a leptoquark. Now, what all of this would mean, one of the big mysteries, actually, let me see if I can get the slides uh, to go back, but ooh, hang, hang on a sec. Right, so this, uh, this picture of the standard model here, um, one of the big mysteries is we don't know why are there six quarks and six leptons um, in this table? And why do they have the properties that they do? We don't know. We, these are just things that we observe in experiments. We can fit them into the theory, but there's no explanation for where they come from. Um, so what the, I, if these ideas are correct, what they could be showing us is that there's a larger picture here with more ingredients, which may form, in effect, a sort of a more symmetrical pattern, which would explain why we have the particles that we do in nature. So that's that's sort of the big the big answer that you might get to eventually, although we're at a very early stage still, and we still don't actually know yet whether these anomalies are real. But it's exciting if they turn out to be real; it'll be it'll definitely be really exciting. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I know there's a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, oh, sorry, I was muted. I was. <laughs> Oh. I was just reading them aloud and I've just realised I was muted. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, we've got some questions in the chat. Hannah Thatcher asks, how green is the LHC? That's a good question. Um, so, I, the LHC does use a lot of power. It's, I think it's something to like the equivalent of 22,000 homes, so a sort of medium-sized town's worth of power. Um, it has a special contract. Well, first of all, most of that power is used in the cryogenics, so the ring, the magnets that make up the ring have to only operate at minus 271 degrees Celsius, just above absolute zero. So it's the largest cryogenic facility in the world is required to chill the whole ring to operating temperature. And most of the power is consumed in the cryogenics, but also in the, the currents and the magnets and also in the computing farms and all kinds. So there's, there's obviously a lot of power being consumed. I know, so I, I probably should know more about this. I know CERN definitely kind of worries about this and it's sort of involved in you know kind of it's installing kind of renewable energy sources on the site and also renewable energy research one of the things it tries to do to mitigate this a little bit is that it uses um well it buys electricity from edf which mostly comes from nuclear power stations which are you know depending on your view of nuclear but it, that, that's pretty green as power sources go and the one of the reasons the lhc runs usually from sort of uh, spring through to just before christmas so from april may time to december and the reason it does that is to avoid putting uh, load demand on the grid in the middle of winter when power consumption is highest so it sort of uses power when it's less needed in the summer um, there's also also there's cost reasons for doing it. obviously power costs more in the winter as well if you're buying large amounts of it so um i hope that sort of vaguely answers your question but it, there's no getting away from the fact that these machines do use quite a lot of power certainly by the, by the standards of experiment of science experiments although not by the standards of you know a lot of other human activity um i'm not sure how, how you would rather do this um how I can would go you through. rather just read read through the questions and answer them as they come up i can i can do that yeah sure um hang on where was the where, where did we I get think the first one was rebecca oh yes uh, how can a bottom quark split up into electrons or myons okay I, I, maybe maybe actually if you read them that'd be great okay how, yeah. how can a bottom quark so it, the bottom quark doesn't split up exactly. So bottom quarks are fundamental 
I mean, all the particles in this in this table you can see in front of you are fundamental particles. It's not that they break up, it's that they transform from one type into another. So the way you could think of this, if you go back to this idea that these particles are all ripples in fields, if you have a bottom quark, what that really is, it's a bit of energy, some vibration in the bottom quark field. What can happen is that all of these fields are connected to each other. So what the forces do effectively is they connect the different matter fields to each other. So one thing that can, you have a vibration, the bottom quark field, the energy in that vibration can go into, for example, um, the W boson, which is the, the weak force field. So that creates a, a ripple, so the, the energy goes out of the, the, the B quark field into the W field, which then goes into, say, the field of the electron and a strange quark. So it's basically, you can think of these as sort of vibrations in different fields that move between the fields. And that's essentially how a particle decays. A, a bottom quark turns into a strange quark and electrons by the energy in its field moving out of that field into the other field. So it's not that the, they're breaking apart per se, um, it's that they're sort of disappearing and being replaced by vibrations in other fields. Cool. Um, Jonas asks, are we only able to detect inconsistencies of the standard model at the LHC, which allows us to conclude that it is not complete, which we somehow know already? Or could we potentially also elucidate the nature of dark matter, dark energy? Well, so first of all, so you're right that we, we know the standard model cannot be complete, but we, so there, there's two different bits of evidence that we have. So, well, we have particle physics experiments that we do like the LHC. And apart from these anomalies that I've mentioned, every experiment we've ever done agrees with the standard model. So when you're studying the basic constituents of matter in the lab, it works perfectly. Where it doesn't work is when you look at the universe at large and you look at cosmology and the movement of galaxies. There you see that there's the standard model is, in, is not able to explain a lot of what we see in the, in the heavens. So that's why we know it's incomplete. Um, so at what we're trying to do at the LHC is, yes, we're trying to find places where the standard model breaks down, where it makes the wrong predictions, because that would give us clues as to what other larger theory might come next um but of course you know there's always possibilities that so that, that includes for example discovering dark matter if you you could create a dark matter particle in the collision that would again be evidence of something beyond the standard model that we've never seen before um but something else i should say is this by no means not the not the only way of of looking for signs of new uh, new physics so there are dedicated uh, dark matter experiments that are big tanks of liquid gas down mine shafts where they basically wait for dark matter in the universe to bump into an ordinary atom, you get a little flash of light. And that is, again, evidence for the existence of dark matter. So there are lots of different ways of doing it. And, and so you think you also mentioned dark energy. In terms of dark energy, um, there's not very much the LHC can tell us about dark energy, as far as I am aware, at least. Um, most of the evidence for dark energy comes from, so far at least, measurements of the universe at large, although there are some lab experiments on Earth, I think, which try to detect it directly, but but not really something that we, we look for at the LHC because it's not really what well, we're not we're not able to basically. Thanks. And then um, the last question um, is from Matt Raymond. So he asked, given the recent push for using AMO techniques to study fundamental physics and the deviations to the standard model. Do you see these influencing the kind of experiments performed at the LHC or in the future FCC? This is really embarrassing. I don't know what AMO stands for. Does anyone know what it means? <laughs> Maybe Matt can clarify. I, in the, in the, uh, I mean, uh, atomic, mole uh, atomic molecular and optical physics. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Okay. That, that yes. So that actually, interestingly, yes. Um, so this is so well, well the one thing I project I, I am familiar with is something called Aon, which is an atom interferometry experiment. Um, now the, the, I should know more about this because my group is involved in this experiment. Basically, the idea is you can look for gravitational waves uh, using atom in a cold atom interferometry. So it's a bit like um, I think basically what happens is you you prepare an atom in a superposition state or in a quantum state, you drop it through a gravitational field, then you recombine two beams of atoms at the bottom, and that can give you evidence of a passing gravitational wave by shifting the path lengths. A bit like a, 
an ordinary optical interferometer works. So I think that's what you're talking about. So yes, there are there's really exciting possibilities from these sorts of experiments and this project Aon that Cambridge and a bunch of other UK universities are involved in. The idea is to build one of these interferometers in UK would be to look for gravitational waves from the early universe is one of the things that they might uh, hope to see. Um, and so one of the big problems that we're trying to address in particle physics is why there is why there is matter in the universe. Basically, what process in the very early universe, in the first you know, millionth of a second, allowed matter to survive, but antimatter to disappear? And in, a, in some models, uh, the processes that cause that would have created very violent gravitational waves that in principle you could pick up with some of these um, interferometry experiments. So, so yeah, it's, it's, I have to admit, it's not an area I'm really expert in, but I know there's definitely exciting options. And, you know, I think there is, to be fair, there is a question about whether a, a new collider will be built given the cost of these experiments. So there's going to come a point where eventually we can't afford to. And I hope it does get built, but, you know, you never know. So we also need to be diversifying and thinking about other ways of understanding fundamental physics that doesn't necessarily involve smashing particles together. And this is one of the, the promising ways of doing that. Great. Thanks, everyone, so much for your questions. And um, thanks for the interesting discussion and really fascinating talk. Um, 